evening, good afternoon. Welcome to Hope 2020, wherever you are in the world. Right now, I'm your MC. I'm here in beautiful Richmond, British Columbia, Canada. I'm actually in the field, as you can see. I'm actually just rotating this to show that I'm not in front of a green screen like you often see in Zoom meetings, be it virtual or real. Our next talk is going to be, fo is going to be focused on Tesla, which a lot of us are at heart. Uh, we're going to explore the wonders of, of, of Wardenclyffe, the historic laboratory built by science visionary Nikola Tesla, where he engineered a colossal 18-story wireless transmitting tower and conducted experiments that still evoke questions and controversy over 100 years later. Your presenter, Mark Alessi, who is the executive director of the Tesla Science Center at Wardenclyffe, will share past, present, and future happenings at the site, including details of a recent discovery made during renovations and fascinating infos on the tunnels beneath Tesla's legendary laboratory. Who doesn't love exploring tunnels? You'll see actual experiments in wireless tech using Tesla coils along with a surprising electric music performance. You can further satisfy your curiosity during the Q&A session. Attendees, please ask us questions through the Q&A link. And now, over to Mark. Well, thank you very much. We are very pleased to be able to join you here tonight. Um, I want to thank Kyle and Emmanuel, and I want to thank Jeff Velez for making sure that you always get us involved with the Hope Conference. Um, I know that uh, we're going to be starting off uh, welcoming you to our portal to Wardenclyffe. Uh, and uh, then we're going to be uh, moving on to a, a number of items uh, where we will be showing off, uh, you know, how we got to this point and uh, how Wardenclyffe was saved. Um, and then we're going to be exploring uh, these new discoveries uh, on the chimney. So I know we had uh, uh, some items that we uh, prepared prior to the show. Don't know if we want to launch them now or if I want to just, if you want me to just go right into a presentation. Hello, my name is Mark Alessi and I'm the executive director at one of the most interesting places on the planet, Tesla Science Center at Wardenclyffe. I'm excited to welcome you to our portal to Wardenclyffe because the people here at the HOPE Conference represent a special segment of our global community, the ones who would appreciate the unique contributions of Nikola Tesla and the almost magical appeal of his life and work. So I wanna start by thanking Emmanuel, Kyle, and everyone involved in the HOPE Conference for bringing us together for an event that allows us to explore the kinds of thought-provoking material we're going to share with you today. First, we're going to take a brief trip back in time to get a glimpse at Tesla, the inventor, and why he built Wardenclyffe. Next, we'll fast forward to our lifetime, where we'll explore how Wardenclyffe was almost destroyed and the global movement that saved it. Then, we'll reveal the latest discovery made during renovations to the chimney of Tesla's lab, followed by details on the tunnels beneath the site. After this exploration of Wardenclyffe, we're going to bring the story to life with a Tesla coil demonstration and electrifying musical performance. Your questions will then be the focus of our closing Q&A. I encourage you all to ask, ask your questions here and I'll answer as much as possible. If we don't get to them all today, we'll record and answer them on our website. We're going to start our journey through the portal to Wardenclyffe with a presentation by award-winning filmmaker, Joseph Sikorsky who will give us a fascinating new perspective on Tesla the inventor and his work at Wardenclyffe. It was a spirit of rogue, experimental rebellion, disruptive of established existing systems with the goal of replacing them with something better. He locked out conventional thinking and he was a provocative force to presumption. When people think of hacking, there's a sort of nervous admiration for the genius with that special kind of talent. And Nikola Tesla certainly incited feelings of nervous admiration from those around him, particularly his peers. He was a kind of alternative scientific artist, like a physics punk rocker. 
he got a different point of view. To start, Tesla saw himself not as an inventor, but as a discoverer, one that reveals solutions already in the framework of existence. To harness the real work of nature, uncovering natural secrets rather than construction built on its limitations. Such an improvisational spirit of exploration led to the concepts of radar, radio, x-rays, robotics, remote control, and even early computer tech. In fact, his teleautomaton patent, in which a prototype was demonstrated at Madison Square Garden in 1898, utilized patents for radio, wireless remote control, and a type of early logic circuit known as the Nano A and D gate, which is sort of the key to binary code. Outside the garden, it was horse and buggy technology. Inside, there was a remote controlled boat under intelligent control. Onlookers thought it was a trick that Tesla had a trained monkey inside it. That's how unimaginable the concept was. But of all his innovations, it was his induction motor, an engine that could efficiently run on alternate current electricity that revolutionized the status quo, propelling the world into an age of progress. Without it, most likely electric power would have been a rare luxury, only accessible to the wealthy this motor, born of Tesla's fertile and untarnished imagination, was previously considered an impossibility by the scientific community, one not achievable through the laws of physics. Tesla hacked through perceived limitations of science and nature to move the world forward. He was a rogue scientist whose unconventional application of physical principles created a sense of unease in the world around him. He was a genius with an amazing talent that you'd hope would be used for benevolence and not maliciousness. One whose brilliance could reward the world with free wireless energy, or punish it with a death ray or earthquake machine. Fortunately for the world, Tesla wore a white hat. And in a way, one could describe his mission at Wardenclyffe as the ultimate hack, a way to disrupt the entire global system of energy and information to help the world evolve, to point out the flaws of an antiquated system and spark a movement of positive change to battle the titans of power and usurp their control to place it in the hands of the people. At Wardenclyffe, he had promised J.P. Morgan a radio tower, but his covert plans were much more ambitious. Free wireless power to any place on the globe. With a 187-foot high tower, he would set energy not through the air as his contemporaries were attempting, but through the earth itself. Such a radical endeavor was far more expensive than Morgan's radio tower. According to legend, after Tesla revealed the true potential of the Wardenclyffe power station, J.P. Morgan questioned how one would be able to meter free electricity just prior to defunding the project. Sadly, this would ultimately lead to the end of Tesla's dream at Wardenclyffe. Whether or not he could have achieved the practical transmission of wireless power is an open debate. One I would personally urge caution with after studying his life for so long. For how many times did Tesla achieve his goal, despite the prevailing scientific consensus? For many, Tesla remains a true inspiration, an intellectual rebel, a scientific agitator, a fighter who violated the most respected preconceived notions of what was deemed possible, a slap in the face to a narrow-minded scientific consensus. Tesla's spontaneous spirit of discovery, in my view, made him the coolest radical thinker on the planet launching an insurrection movement against the accepted scientific norms. He was a visionary so far ahead of his time, a genius loner in a white hat. Thank you, Joe Sikorsky, for that amazing perspective on Tesla's genius and work at Wardenclyffe. Joe's work also reflects Tesla's inventiveness and humanitarian spirit. And we're proud to have him as a supporter since the beginning of the efforts to resurrect Wardenclyffe decades ago. That's where we're headed now as we move forward in time to the next part of our journey through the portal to Wardenclyffe. In 1987, when the successor in interest, you know, first it was Peerless and then Bear Corp and then Ag when they decided to close this part of their operation down and move all our operations to New Jersey, this site went into a decades long cleanup. And a very um, diligent local group uh, came together from the community, uh, science teachers and enthusiasts who realized the historical significance of this place. And they organized the rest of us in the community. So 
Uh, here on this slide, you can see a number of elected officials and community members. This place matters, um, you know, putting our, our, our stake in the ground. So at the time, I was an elected official in the community and, you know, working with other colleagues in government and members of the community and the current board of Tesla Science Center, who was at this for over 20 years trying to save this property. Um, I was able to secure some uh, state grant funding uh, that would help purchase the property, but they needed a match. And um, how that came in was the, the crowdfunding campaign. So uh, our board president, Jane Alcorn, uh, was reaching out to Matt Inman from oatmeal.com, a super blogger uh, and, and cartoonist who had a huge tech geek following and had done a cartoon in the past uh, about how Tesla's the greatest geek that ever lived. And, you know, what happened when Jane and, and uh, Matt Inman came together and said, let's launch this crowdfund is they were able to catch lightning in a bottle. Uh, we, you know, many people continue to study this crowdfund, uh, which was one of the most successful crowdfunds and held the world record on the uh, grassroots involvement all the way up until last year with the 20 million trees campaign. And as an aside, uh, if, if anything, Tesla was going to you know, lose a world record, I'm sure he would have appreciated losing to such a great cause as the 20 million trees campaign. Uh, Tesla was truly one of the, uh, a very strong environmentalist and wanted to see us using uh, the earth's forces to, to power uh, the, the, the needs of mankind. So with this crowdfund, it raised $1.4 million in six weeks from 108 countries from 33,000 donors. And in all 50 states of the United States, in addition to those 108 countries, participated. So it was really widespread. Uh, I believe this organization and this location is a world historic site. And whether this crowdfund happened or not, uh, this is a global uh, center. Where we're at now, we just got on the National Historic of, uh, Registry uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, and that enabled us to, uh, one, make sure this place stays preserved long into the future, and to open up uh, the location for some federal tax credits. Uh, but it was a historic moment again, uh, where our state parks uh, system was overrun with letters supporting our application. Um, I think we broke all records there. I think over 10,000 letters were sent in three days for people asking for this to be registered as a historic site. And the project has uh, pulled together um, a very strong and interesting list of both benefactors and advisors and collaborators. Um, so we're, we're, we're pretty lucky to have the kind of support that we're beginning to garner for this uh, project. It's a $20 million project um, and we raised just over half of that already. So uh, we raised about uh, $10.2 million. Uh, we have enough money on hand to get started and we'll be able to open our first building uh, within the next year to the public with our first exhibit. So uh, we hired um, a architectural firm, an engineering firm, filed for our first permits to actually start construction pulled some early permits and actually began some construction on site just a few months ago. Uh, it was paused because of COVID-19, but we're back at work. Uh, but our goal is to get the full site plan approved because that's when we really can start uh, the, the large scale demolition of the buildings around the lab and can start on the lab in earnest. And as we're piecing together that permit process, it should be done uh, towards the end of this year. So this is the first building that we're going to be opening. Uh, the goal was by the end of this year, COVID-19 put a little dent about uh, two to three months in that process, but we're still striving to open this as quickly as possible. And definitely by the end of the winter of uh, 2020, 2021, uh, we'll have our first building open. Uh, this is a rendering of the lab building. And uh, currently there's a lot of different offices and, and um, rooms cut up into this building right now. So we want to restore it to this rendering right here, which is the way it was um, in, in, in Tesla's time. This is what Tesla was working with and we're planning on restoring it to that, that, um, that time period.
And this is an example of what the full comprehensive science center could look like if we were to build larger buildings on site in addition to uh, the lab building. You know, education is a main focal point for this center. It's one of the main reasons that the board originally organized themselves to create uh, a, a organization at Tesla's lab. And uh, we're trying to lead the way with cutting edge education and, and virtual education in the STEM space. Uh, so that's the general overview of our project. Um, we welcome all supporters, whether they're benefactors and donors or folks that think they can add uh, some value as a volunteer, um, you know, help us fulfill this mission. If you, if you listen to the, long, uh, to the end of this uh, pro uh, proposal, uh, proposal or presentation, uh, you're obviously interested in this subject matter. So any way that you can help, any introductions you can make, uh, any donations that you can make, uh, once we open the doors and once the lab is complete and we finish raising that eight to nine million dollars, uh, this organization will have you know enough revenue coming in uh, through the programming to make it sustainable and to make sure that well into the future we can tell Tesla's story and most importantly spread his ethos, which is the importance of innovation for humanity. Thank you. Now we're going to explore some of the most intriguing aspects of Wardenclyffe. During recent renovations on the laboratory, a discovery was made in Tesla's chimney that we're going to delve into with Joe Sikorsky and Mark Thaler, our expert in historic architecture. Then you'll watch a presentation by best-selling Tesla biographer, Mark Seifer, who will share rare images and information about the tunnels beneath Wardenclyffe. Hi, I'm Mark Thaler. I'm a partner with Lacey Thaler, Riley Wilson, Architecture and Preservation. I've um, been working at uh, the Tesla Laboratory now for uh, four years. Um, originally started doing an historic structure report to identify uh, what remained of the original laboratory and, and what needed to be done. Uh, we then were able to assist in getting the building listed on the National Register of as building of national importance. And um, now we are in the process of doing the first phase of the restoration, which uh, is the restoration of the cupola and chimney uh, on the laboratory. And so as part of that uh, investigation, uh, we were able to uh, find uh, a new element that we had not previously uh, known to exist, and that was a relieving arch at the base of the chimney. And my name is Joe Sikorsky. I am a filmmaker and a researcher. I've been researching Tesla and Warrencliffe for, wow, almost 20 years. Is that even possible? Um, it's great to have Mark here. And um, I'd like to ask you a question regarding uh, the exploration of this new discovery, which is exciting. Um, first thing is, uh, you know, there, it's possible this is just a very mundane discovery. It could just be a venting system uh, or not. Maybe it's something amazing. Is this a part of architecture that would be standard in uh, buildings created in this time period at the turn of, turn of the century? Or is this something that you think is unique to uh, construction? I think the... Uh, the potential uh, uses of that archway, that opening, um, you know, certainly uh, providing uh, a draft to a chimney of that magnitude, um, you know, is important. Uh, it's interesting that, you know, when we initially had uh, discovered it through looking through the uh, the breaching uh, that's in the adjacent room, and we saw, you know, sort of peer down into the uh, the base of the chimney, uh, which was the first time that we saw that this archway was there. Uh, at the time, you know, we had had the uh, original uh, drawings, uh, the floor plans, and the, uh, the section of the building, but it didn't show that. Um, 
when we tried to uh, you know utilize our uh, tape measures uh, you know to stick that down the, the hole to actually try to measure it um, the breeze coming through there was quite significant it actually blew the tape away from the wall you know once we got it down to that elevation um, so clearly there was already a lot of draft coming through there which was extremely curious because there was no obvious uh, inlet for that air coming into the chimney, um, you know, beyond, because we had no idea, you know, where that opening led to. Um, there's an early photograph uh, of the north side of the uh, laboratory yes. that shows at grade level a uh, sort of a raised stone. It almost looks uh, to me, like it was an area where you could pull draft from for a chimney. Um, but, you know, that currently is completely buried. And so there is no opportunity for air to come in that way. So where exactly the air was coming from, um, you know, remains to be seen to this day. Um, now, in addition to uh, the fact that, you know, you would need to supply, you know, a draft air uh, source uh, in this regard. Um, you know, the other thing that, you know, this actually uh, can provide is a, a way to clean out the base of the chimney, right? So the opening uh, at the base of the chimney uh, faces uh, to the east which is where the boilers uh, were located. Now, uh, we don't know the exact uh, footprint of, of where those boilers sat, um, but you know, if there was the capacity to be able to get in from the floor you know, through a hatch down to that elevation, you know, it certainly makes sense that you, know, you could uh, provide that as as a means of you know cleaning out the base of the chimney you know just like uh, you know uh, you would do um, you know to try to clean out any ash or anything else that accumulated at the base. Huh. So Mark so then um, if the north side vent is not exposed and that is not where the uh, breeze is coming through um, is it your opinion that um, it is a an engineered port somewhere that's bringing in, or could it be deterioration of the building? Could there be other reasons for an airflow coming in? Well, when um, the the contractors uh, from Skyline uh, were able to go down there, Kevin Cahill uh, was able to descend um, into the space. They were able to because we were working on the chimney. Uh, they had actually taken the chimney down to roof level uh, because of deterioration in the brickwork. So as part of the restoration work, they had actually had to take the chimney down. When they, when they were able to do that, they could then lower a ladder down into the uh, base of the chimney. And Kevin actually entered uh, the chimney from that uh, breaching hole in the, in the uh, south side of it. Uh, went down the, the ladder and um, actually looked at some of the, uh, uh, the, the openings that were there. And he was able to determine that the, from the north side, or I'm sorry, from the east side, uh, where the relieving arch is, there was a uh, tunnel that led to the east, and then it stopped. And then there was a little leg that went to the north uh, where we would expect, you know, it might have gone to this uh, opening, but it, but there was a wall there and that sort of sealed it off. Um, however, in this tunnel, there was an area where uh, the brick had partially collapsed and there was additional void below the slab of the laboratory. 
now we don't know where that potentially goes. Um, and so there could still be, um, you know, openings that, uh, you know, travel below the slab to, to some location that, you know, to this point remain undetermined. So trying to find out, you know, where some of those voids are be below the slab, uh, would be, you know, really interesting to find out. Um, because at the moment we don't know what the extent of, you know, those, uh, basically underground tunnels, you know, where they went. So it's possible it connects to the underground tunnel system. Yes. It's very interesting. Mark Thaler, thank you so much for all the effort you put into uh, researching this for this very, very important site. And now we are going to go back to the rest of the Tesla Science Center at Wardenclyffe presentation. So we're now in Washington, D.C., and Jason comes back with the, um, with the chip, you know, the flash drive, which we're going to look at. And this is from the ground penetrating radar. No one has ever seen this before. And my jaw drops because this is all done live. We don't practice stuff and then shoot it. We, we, they just give us the information and boom, it's shot for the Tesla files. So here you can see in yellow, those are the earth grippers. The brown shaft is going down about 50 feet and the white, uh, the white circular area, we're gonna get a better shot of it too, but uh, while we're looking at it, the white circular area is cement that they poured down about 15 or 20 years ago to block because unfortunately this shaft became a dump site but the timbers are still there for the uh for the central shaft and what's in red are the tunnels uh there are four of them and we'll see another shot of it it's, it's a much better shot and what's in blue is where the tunnels have collapsed but if you if you look carefully here you, you again see the earth grippers. There are about a dozen of them. So, and that, that shaft going down is about 50 feet down. Now, why did he have the tunnels? I think he had the tunnels because, I don't know if you have about you, but going down five flights or seven flights of stairs every day uh, could be very tiring. So I think his plan was to bring equipment uh, down there and to, to keep a base actually down there. These tunnels are 100 feet long each. They're actually still there. Um, and I think that we could probably maybe get a probe uh, to go down there and look in there. There may or may not be any equipment in there. Um, but that's what I think it was. I think he was going to do testing there. And the idea was that this is the Earth grippers. His plan was to map out the entire Earth. He, he knew the, the size of the Earth, the speed of light, um, and the length of the electrical waves that he was going to send. Since he was sending it through the ground, if you extend the wave, for instance, if it's 60 miles from Wardenclyffe to New York City, if you have an electrical wave that lands in New York City, then you can transmit power from, from Wardenclyffe to New York City. If, if you want to send it to San Francisco, you need an electrical wave that's 3,500 miles long. And he could create electrical waves 3,500 miles long and pinpoint it to San Francisco. But he wanted to set up additional towers where he was going to send these, these uh, various electrical power waves. And they'd be picked up by a central tower uh, in Europe or, or every place to, and have a wireless uh, uh, network of, uh, of uh, mostly telephone. But he also was going to transmit power if he succeeded. Okay, well, uh, thanks for coming out and uh, tuning in today, everyone. I imagine everybody here is familiar with Nikola Tesla. Um, and that his most famous invention was the AC induction motor. He built single phase and eventually polyphase versions of this. I think right now there's about 13 billion horsepower of uh, induction motors in service. 
And although the AC induction motor was his most famous invention, he spent a great deal of his life uh, working on his system to send power around the world without wires. Tesla's idea was to place a number of high voltage towers uh, like these ones in the diagram at strategic locations around the globe. In 1899, Tesla started working on the drive system for his towers at Colorado Springs. After finishing the drive system in Colorado Springs, he started building a 187 foot tall tower back in Long Island at Wardenclyffe. Unfortunately, Tesla ran out of money halfway through the project, so he never got to finish it and close the switch. Ultimately, Wardenclyffe was torn down and scrapped in 1915 to satisfy Tesla's creditors. So would it have worked? I wanted to try to do something practical with Tesla's idea like power is something I could ride around on. I hope Tesla would think this is practical anyways. So let's uh, wander over and take a look at the uh, wireless power setup. It's a little bit of a walk over here since all these pieces of equipment have to stay apart a ways due to the high voltage. So over here, we have what I call the world's first real Tesla Roadster. It's a three-wheeled bicycle uh, that I modified. You can see uh, now it has an electric motor on the front driving the front wheel. But unlike any other electric vehicle, it has no batteries, none whatsoever. So instead of needing to charge batteries, all of the electric power comes through the air, quietly and invisibly, at least when everything's working right. The antenna up here above the driver picks up the ambient electric fields uh, from, from the air and sends the energy down this mast to a transformer set here in the base. This little transformer actually operates as a reverse Tesla coil, and it steps down the voltage from the aerial to a relatively low voltage, like 100 volts, and sends that 100 volts off over to the motor. You'll also notice there, there's a chain dragging behind the roadster. That returns the, the currents from the primary to Earth, and uh, the Earth is treated as a conductor in this case. Even the concrete floor is, is a fine conductor, at least, at least for this application. And the earth return is the essential component of uh, Tesla's wireless system. So let's go over here and set up the camera. and hide my laptop on the box here so it doesn't get destroyed. And let's see if we can transfer some wireless power. All right, fire when ready. All right, crank it up a little. Ha ha ha. 
Pick him up, hey! Kill me now. <laughs> okay, let's one more time around. Okay, cut it. Oh my god, I don't think about We are virtually clapping. That breaks me. We are virtually clapping for you. That was amazing. Okay, so uh, Tesla's wireless power scheme really does kind of work. You might have noticed uh, from the camera that there was some arcing on the chain as it dragged across the concrete. That's because concrete isn't a perfect conductor, but it's good enough for this application. Okay, so now let's see what a million volts looks like. For this demonstration, however, I'm going to need to hide my camera behind this heavy metal electric shield if I ever want to use the camera again. Line it up here. Okay, man's on. Oh, breaker on. So for the last five years, I've been building this 40 foot tall, fully functional scale prototype. Here's a clip of the 40 foot tower uh, running at Warden Cliff uh, using the uh, old foundation as a ground. Safety first.
Hi, we're Architect from Austin, Texas. We want to thank you guys for having us out here today. Uh, I am John, and this is Joe. Hello. We are the Brothers to Prima. And uh, what you just saw there was a couple of musical Tesla coils. They are solid-state Tesla coils that we've engineered in such a way that they play music. So the melody that you were just hearing a second ago was actually coming from the sparks itself. And how that works is similar to how a speaker cone works, by vibrating air back and forth. But instead of a physical speaker cone moving back and forth, we start and stop the spark at the same rate the speaker would move. And you know, if we get it to start and stop faster, we get higher notes. If we get it to start and stop slower, we get lower notes. And that's basically the gist of what we do. Oh, and we also have a robot drummer. I don't know if yep. you guys caught that one. He's in the background. Yeah. But uh, what do you say we play another song? Uh, yeah, sure. All right, the yep. mics are muting and going back to coils. Thank you guys for having us out here. Once again, we are Architect. Thank you very much, and we'll pass it back off to you guys. And we are live. Jen, are you, uh, you, you with us there? You're still getting situated. Okay, your, your job then, please take it away. We do have a, a, at least one question queued up, but that was amazing. The chat was uh, as enthusiastic as it's ever been today here at Hope on the uh, Matrix chat. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're with us, Jen. Excellent, excellent. Welcome back. So um, just scrolling through the chat, through, of course, the, the, uh, the Element Matrix instance available only to conference attendees. Uh, one of the questions, <laughs> uh, uh, one of the great comments, yeah. probably between the five Jamaican shilling and the five Iraqi dinar. Um, now, sorry about that. Jen, I just pasted your question in the Zoom sure. chat. You might want to read. Yeah, sorry. It's, uh, Jen is uh, doing uh, uh, super duty here. So, <laughs> well, While you look up the, the, the questions, we actually had a couple of questions emailed to us uh, beforehand. But uh, before I even start answering those and going to those, I want to thank Joe Sikorsky uh, and Mark Thaler, the architects, Mark Seifer, Greg Lay, who you saw built the biggest Tesla coils in the world. And then Joe and John DePrima, the brothers from Architect, uh, for that great performance. And I know I thanked them before, but you know, Jeff, you're joining us tonight. Thank you so much for making sure that we're always at hope. Uh, and obviously Greg and Jen, thanks for having us here. So the, the three e questions that were emailed to us beforehand, uh, people are always interested in the tower. And they asked, do you plan to rebuild the tower? And uh, the answer is yes, but we're not endeavoring to try to make it this to okay. we're not trying to make it the working tower. But uh, Tesla was, um, you know, what was endeavoring on. 
but uh, as people come to the site, we want to make sure that uh, they get the idea of the size of this tower. Uh, so after the buildings are open and the museum is open, that's part of our phase two. Um, and then another email came in from some conference attendees. What are the next plans for exploring the chimney discovery? And uh, we're continuing to document uh, that entire process. Uh, and you know, the, as we learn more, we're going to determine if there's any connection uh, to the tunnels. Um, and the, the third question was, during the renovations to the lab, will you look for the access to the tunnels? And absolutely. Um, you know, our goal is, if, you know, as we redo the lab, to learn as much as we can about the connections between the lab, the tunnels, the tower base. But uh, after all that's done, well into the future, we'll continue to study the tunnels and maybe excavate eventually to learn more about how the system works. So that's all the emails I had come in. So now it's... <laughs> all right, so a couple questions that came in via the chat. Um, the first question is, out of curiosity, how far away would you be able to hear the spark gap on a radio? That... Do you have any idea? That's an interesting question. I, I mean, Jeff, you know, we had a demonstration uh, on site that you put on just a few weeks ago uh, for some of the volunteers. And we were pretty amazed about the reach for LED lights, but the spark gap itself, what would you think, Jeff? How, how far do you think that would go? Goodness gracious. I mean, for any tuned radio, I think they would probably pick it up for easily a couple miles on that. I had a non-contact voltage detector at um, our last event, and then also at Greg Lay's demonstration, where non-contact detector, you usually have to be right on the wire to pick up you know, any, any voltage coming across it. This puppy was lighting up a good 100, 110 feet away from the small little Tesla coil that we were operating at that exhibit. Now, Greg Lay's monster 40-foot coil, I was picking up with a non-contact detector three four hundred feet away with that so so from a radio receiver i i think we were stepping on a lot of a lot of ham channels and <laughs> probably interrupting a, a lot of radio oh uh, yeah i could easily imagine that messing up with anybody going qsl um now is all this energy that the that's going through the air at all dangerous so um i i know a lot of folks question whether if tesla could have pulled off the wireless transmission of electricity, you know, what would be the EMF concerns? And I'm not an electrical engineer to be able to determine what the actual amount of EMF that would actually be in the area of a tower would, would, would be. But I, I do know that um, we have, a, you know, electrical waves, microwaves, radio waves around us all the time. We're sitting in our home, we have Wi-Fi systems, our cell phones throw off a lot of, of waves. So, you know, I don't, you know, I know that there's some concerns with microwaves, radio waves, electrical waves in general. Um, for us, questions like that, we plan to pull together experts to study whether or not, you know, you know, the tower would have worked in its, in the form that he was working on. You know, uh, you saw that, Joe Sikorsky mentioned that he lost his funding and never had it work, um, but he might have pivoted. So we don't know exactly what the final form would have been. Okay, and that unfortunately wraps up the time that we have for this session. Mark Alessi, thank you very much. I would love, I can't wait to visit Wardenclyffe once, when this current crisis is over and hopefully before the next event that we get to get, that we can meet up in person. Look forward to having you, thank you.